So yeah, so essentially what is the point of these four lectures is that to give you the glimpse of how graph algorithms can be made better and faster when you use ideas from continuous optimization or rather, you know, how to develop continuous optimization as the right language for doing graph algorithms. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that I agree that this is somewhat controversial, so I will try to make it a bit less controversial. Hopefully by the end of this series of lectures, you will see it as a bit less controversial than, uh, than you might think about it now. So yeah, so this time, this will be the only lecture I will give you with slides because I just want to give you an overview of essentially what is the broader picture behind all that's happening and somehow you know what is the skeleton uh, of you know of the key ideas and results that then we will try to uh, f uh, to f fill out you know as we go through this like lectures which will be blackboard and one very important thing is you know even though this is like four hours of lectures I will not really able to give you the complete picture so the point is to just give you the basic ideas so in particular, it means that I don't have to finish everything I planned to cover because I, as usual, I try to be over ambitious. So please do stop me with questions because in the end, you know, the point is to just get a glimpse and understand the glimpse of it. And somehow, you know, if you don't ask questions, then usually, you know, it's, I'm not a great uh, speaker. So, you know, so it means that you are, that something is just not, you know, uh, like you, you should try to understand. Like it, everything should be, especially after, like after this lecture, this lecture will be a bit fast, but afterwards, Hopefully everything is, uh, is should be possible to understand. So you know if it's so, if it's not so, ask a question because it's my fault. Okay, good. So yeah, so graph uh, algorithms and continuous optimization. So let me talk about that. But you know before I do it, I just really want to, I really want to make this uh, you know one point that hopefully yes, this is very important. And I think as a field we don't appreciate it enough. So I always make sure to mention it. Is that actually how fundamental? graphs are and graph algorithms are. So of course we know they are fundamental for anything that happens in computer science, right? This is, you know, what we see, you know, if you think of routing, if you think of, you know, of uh, load balancing, inference, uh, like so on and so on, we all do know that, you know, the graph algorithms are completely fundamental here. But somehow the thing that we don't appreciate enough is that by now, essentially every field of modern science is using graph algorithms in a very fundamental way. So essentially, it's not only about computer science anymore, it's really one of the tools, one of the key lenses of understanding sciences nowadays, okay? If it's biology, physics, or chemistry, you know, it's just, it's just real. So, you know, again, we don't have to know what are these applications, but it's very good and, you know, very rewarding to know that, yeah, that in the end, these ideas actually are very useful beyond computer science, okay? So these are graphs. And now, you know, but we talk here about algorithmic graph theory. So what's happening in graph theory or what was happening for the last 50 years? So yeah, so essentially, yeah, the graph algorithm, I guess, started in like 1940s or something like that. And, you know, what was happening is this is like an extremely, extremely important area of not only like of algorithms in general. So essentially what happened is that many of the key ideas in the algorithms, they first were conceived in the context of graph problems. So in particular, if you take, a, you know, an intro to algorithms class, there is a lot of about graph algorithms exactly for this reason. These are like sometimes the most basic problems to introduce some of the key ideas. And you know, by now we have of course a number of beautiful sophisticated algorithms for many, many, many graph problems. And you know, if you look at these problems, then you will see a pattern, okay? So most of these algorithms, they are usually you know, beautifully handcrafted uh, and combinatorial, so essentially like, you know, you find the, you find the problem and you think hard, you know, how to find the better approach, the best approach to it. And usually this best approach is combinatorial. What it means really is that, you know, it's, there's no formal definition, but it usually talks about like manipulating discrete objects, like, you know, paths, edges, cuts, partitions, and so on. Okay, so this is how you reason about graphs in, in, in algorithmic uh, graph theory. And, you know, this is only natural because graphs are discrete objects. They have edges, they have cuts, you know, that's, that's the language we should be using to talk about them. And somehow the dominating mindset, like even like maybe 20 years ago in the paper was that the word combinatorial was equivalent to fast. So somehow you said the only way to get fast graph algorithms was to make them combinatorial. And you know, if you use combinatorial, it means it is fast. And somehow this was like a very strong feeling that this should be the way to think about graph algorithms. And you know, somehow, you know, as a result, like the typical, you know, sort of production cycle of an algorithm looks as follows. So, you know, so imagine, you know, I sit in my office and then my friend comes and says, okay, you know, to cure cancer, I need to solve, let's say, mean cost rabbit free matching in frog-like graphs. Okay? 
That's some problem that he says, okay, if you solve it, I can cure cancer. So can you help me? Well, I say, of course, sure, why not? And they start thinking hard, okay? So, you know, at first I try some standard stuff. Doesn't work, okay, N nothing new here. Then you know, I start to being a bit more inventive, try to combine some techniques and, you know, nothing really happens again. And then I think really, really, really hard, okay? And, you know, and, you know, finally, after a lot of uh, agoniz agonization over that, I succeed. I come up with some like, slick algorithm. There is some very cute idea. You know, I get very fast algorithm, you know, victory. Okay, I achieved what I wanted. So, you know, so this is how things often work. And, you know, a priori, there is nothing wrong with that. But if you think about it really like more broadly, like is it really the right approach to do graph algorithms? So in a sense, you know, if you are like a graph algorithm aficionado as, as I am, you know, you enjoy it. Yes, that's what you live for, is just to try to solve all these puzzles. But if you think from the point of view of your friend who actually just wants to solve graph problems, this might not be the best thing to do. So first of all, you know, combinatorial being combinatorial comes as a price because combinatorial usually means that you, you, know, you have to come up with some ad hoc analysis which is hard to come up. And also, you know, essentially whenever you want to solve a new problem, you need an expert who actually understands these combinatorial ideas and can apply them in some creative way. You know, good for us, it keeps us in business, but you know, maybe not, not good for everyone. And you know, it is hard to come with new algorithms, uh, come up with new algorithms because you know, it's just hard and you know, I can attest that on many, many examples, especially the ones that when I failed. And what is even more important is that actually there is no robustness here. So essentially imagine that, okay, I solved this, you know, this new pro graph problem for, uh, for my friend, and then he was very happy at first, but then he ran some experiments, he realizes that actually, you know, the problem I would like to solve is a little bit different, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I you know, need just to change these constraints a little bit. And at this point says, okay, can you solve this new problem? And at this point essentially you are usually, you know, uh, you have to start from a scratch because you know everything you develop develop on this very intricate uh, constraints. So somehow you know it's really you just need, probably need to come up with a different algorithm to solve a slightly different problem. So there is no robustness in this hand. And again, of course, each of the whenever you develop an algorithm, you actually have to Im deploy it and implement. And if you have to do it from a scratch each time you have a new problem, this again is not ideal. So you know. So the question is, this is you know this is how it is now. But you know, is it really the right way to do things? And as you know, usually know, you know, the, the question is, you know, the answer is no. Of course, that's the whole point of this talk. So somehow, so you know, so much of what I will talk about is exactly applying continuous optimization to graph algorithms, but also I like to view it as it's trying to make the you know the picture uh, like essentially the whole uh, field of graph algorithms more unified and principled. Okay, so ideally, so, so, so the particular, of course, angle I'm trying to push here is that what I want to do, I want to, do, I want to make continuous optimization the language of graph algorithms. So essentially, whenever we have a graph problem, we should translate it into a language of continuous optimization and try to solve it there. And, you know, and somehow, you know, that I, as, you will, as hopefully you will see over the last, next four lectures, this is actually has a lot of benefits. So in particular, you know, yeah, so that's what you do. So, so you, you take a graph problem, you formulate it as a continuous optimization task, maybe it's an LP or constraint minimization problem or SDP. Then you, and this is the really nice part, is that once you have an LP, well, we know what are the off-the-shelf algorithms to solve LPs. Yes, like this is like an extremely well-studied problem. So, you know, we immediately know what the algorithm is. Like once we do the translation, we immediately know what the algorithm is. We don't have to be smart here. And then, okay, usually this like completely off-the-shelf algorithm will not give you the best performance, but then, only then, you have to be, try to be a little bit more, uh, you know, more inventive to just get this, you know, the last bit of performance. But essentially, like, you already get, you know, these first two points are almost automatic, and you already get a reasonable algorithm just by applying it in the right way. Okay? And of course, you know, as already Fedor said, you know, when you say that, okay, I'm not the first one to think of it, and, but the conventional wisdom will be, oh, this, this forget about it. This will not work because, you know, somehow, well, graphs are inherently combinatorial, right? And somehow what you are doing, so you are using the wrong language to talk about them, and most of these general continuous optimization tools, they actually are quite slow. So essentially, you will really not get competitive algorithms, you know, in this way. But, you know, as conventional wisdom of, of often is, this is not really true, or it turns out to be not really true, because this actual approach did work already multiple times. And in particular, for one of the like staple combinatorial problems of uh, computing matchings and flows, essentially all the fastest algorithms now are coming through this, uh, through this angle in all the regimes. Okay? 
So this is, you know, the, uh, uh, this is the goal. And then what I want to do this week is exactly try to illustrate this general theme on an example of a simple problem. So you can just get a feel of how it works out. The problem I will talk about is the maximum flow, or specifically the unit capacity version of the maximum flow problem. And somehow the underlying approach that you will see is that somehow what will really happen when we translate our problem into continuous optimization and then solve it there, that in the end, if you look back at what is the algorithm that we get, what they do is they, they, they try to relate the combinatorial structure of the graph to analytic and linear algebraic properties of certain matrices that are associated with this graph. Okay, this matrix is called Laplace matrix. Okay, so in the end, they actually are very new and very different algorithms that turn out to be, you know, very very powerful and actually very very promising. Okay, so this is sort of what is about to happen. So let me just introduce the main, you know, the main uh, the main person in the story, namely the maximum flow problem. So when we talk about maximum flow, we talk about a directed graph G, and there are two special vertices, source S and sinc T, and then we have capacities on edges. And most of the times we will assume capacities are one, but for now let's just introduce it in generality. So you can think of it like arcs as being roads, a capacity corresponds to the number of lanes on the world, and S is like S and T are origin and destination. And what you are trying to find, well, you are trying to find a feasible ST flow of maximum value, which you can think, you know, estimate the maximum possible rate of traffic between S and T in this graph. And somehow what it means mathematically is that, well, flow is just a segment of numbers to edges. And now the two kind of constraints that you would like to have to have a valid ST flow is that first of all there is no leaks on vertices other than S and T. Okay, so the flow in is equal to flow out on every vertex other than S and T. And then the other thing is that there is no overflow. So essentially you never flow and like essentially you never flow more than the capacity on a given arc. Okay, so anything that satisfies this type of constraints is a valid ST flow. And now what do you, among all these flows, what do you try to maximize? Well, you try to maximize the value of the, of, of the flow, meaning the net flow out of S, which is equal to the net flow uh, into T, so essentially the amount of stuff that you send from S to T while satisfying capacity constraints. Okay? So that's the problem. I hope this is not the first time you see it. It's quite a well-known problem, I hope. And yeah, here we have like a value of seven. This is actually not the max flow, and you know, here is the, the way to do it you know, more optimally, to actually get the value of 10. Okay, so this is the problem, and you know, as always, we should wonder, wonder okay, why is it a good problem to study? And there is many reasons. You know, one of them is by induction. You know, everyone studied this, so you know, we should we should do. So it's a fundamental optimization problem. But of course, there are reasons why people are interested. So you know, it's studied since 1930s. It has surprisingly diverse set of applications. So of course, you know, quite obviously, you see some application to transportation. But what really makes this problem powerful is that there is a whole other uh, host of problems that you know there are some like non-trivial reduction that essentially you know reduce uh, like end up identifying that if you want, for instance, to, to uh, partition a graph, you might reduce this question to solving max flow problem. Okay, so there is like a lot of, lot of application. So this is like a very, very, you know, very, uh, very broadly applied algorithm. And also from the point of view of uh, a theorist of someone who actually wants to come up with new algorithms, is that you know, this uh, this problem was sort of like the hotbed of algorithmic developments for many, many, many ideas. Let's say I guess the most famous ones is the primal dual method, like the max max flow min cut theorem. So essentially, it seems that this is a problem where it's you no, know, it's very like making any progress requires coming up with new ideas. So yeah, if you want to come up with new ideas, that's where you should start. Okay. So this is why you know why we you know why we uh, care about this problem. So what is known about it? So first of all, you know. Our focus today and also in the rest of this lecture will be to uh, look at the particular regime of max flow, namely we will always look at the graphs that are sparse, meaning the number of edges is not much larger than the number of vertices. Okay, so this is of course a special case of the problem, but actually it is a great benchmark for computational graph algorithms. So all the developments first happened in this, in this regime and only later on were generalized to arbitrary densities. Okay, so that's what we will s stick to then. And then if you look at the, uh, at the history of max flow, so there are like two eras. So first is a classic era of, of maximum flow, and essentially it uses like purely computational algorithms. Okay, and there are like two uh, landmark developments there are actually, for unit capacity case, you can get n to the three half uh, algorithms. This is an uh, independent result of, you know, of uh, even and Tarjan and of Karzanov. And as you can realize, there is a reason why there are different years and they're independent. And I, have, I hope the names uh, uh, tell you why. 
uh, or maybe you are too young. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, so essentially, well, one of them was developed like on the one side of the iron curtain, and the other one was developed in Russia by Karzanov. And yeah, the information didn't flow too fast there. So so it was actually quite interesting that the algorithms are essentially the same. So the ideas somehow were fundamental, and they were developed independently. Okay, and then uh, much much later on in 1998, uh, Goldberg and Rao developed, which is actually funny because yeah, one of them is a, a, an American scientist, the other one is the Russian scientist. So I guess things, the ideas now were you know were sort of uh, like uh, like people were exchanging ideas nowadays. And essentially, what you get out of this is you know n to the three halves uh, algorithm, which is sort of matches the performance for the unit capacity case. But there is this emerging barrier barrier of n to the three halves. Essentially, you know this is what we knew for unit capacity graphs what to do in 1973 since then no improvement okay so this is the barrier and that's somehow in a sense like it's in an end of the classical era so now what we have is the modern era which is essentially what I will talk about uh, today so this is this weird era when we instead of doing you know the computer <laughs> combinatorial approaches as we used to do what we do instead is we use this linear algebra and continuous optimization to get our results and somehow you know Essentially, when you think about solving, uh, you know, max flow in this regime, so you know, when you see such a barrier, you might wonder, okay, you know, how to approach it, how to try to do something there if this seems to be so notoriously hard to improve. And the first thing you might think, okay, let's think of a relaxed version of the problem when we just think about approximate answers and you think only about underrated graphs. And even for that, we didn't know anything better than n to the three halves until you know, there was a beautiful line of work that I was involved in that essentially showed that, okay, like by consecutive improvements, what we end up having in the end is that we are actually able to solve you know, this approximate max flow in undirected graphs in essentially the best possible time, namely in, you know, in nonlinear time. Okay, so essentially you can get one perceptual approximation in n over epsilon squared time. I use this like weak notation over, over here, it means just I'm just hiding some polylogarithmic factors. So you know, for the sake of these lectures, this is we don't care about them. So but you know the point is that suddenly we go from n to u three halves to nearly linear in this approximate sense. But then of course you might wonder, okay, what happens if you actually care about uh, the direct and exact case? And then it's actually this idea still translate, and what you can get, well, not as dramatic improvement as before, you get essentially for unit capacity, it's n to the 10 over seven, which, you know, all that should matter for now is that this is better than three halves. So somehow, at least we made some progress on this like 40 years plus uh, problem. So we definitely have some new insights that we didn't have before, okay? And you know, and what will happen in these lectures, I will try to give you a glimpse, you know, how you could use continuous optimization to solve this problem, and you know, essentially what's going on there. Okay, so you know, before we talk about the new stuff, it's good to talk about the old stuff just to see you know, what is the difference. So if you think about the classic approaches to uh, solving Mars flow, there is you know, essentially one you know, most popular method. This is so-called augmenting pass framework which, due to Ford and Fulkerson. So how it works is it works in a very simple way. What you do is just you solve Mars flow by repeatedly finding ST paths in so-called residual graph. So what it means in unique capacity is actually very simple. So I started with my original graph. This is my original graph at the beginning. Now I find an ST path, and then I want to push the flow among this path, which I just denote by essentially flipping the directions of arcs on this, you know, on this graph. Okay? This is now my new residual graph. And now I just repeat. I just find an ST path in this new graph, and I flip the directions of the edges on this, on this, on this, on this new path. And you know, it might unflip some of the old, uh, some already flipped edges, that's all fine. And I keep doing it until I cannot find an ST path in the residual graph anymore. So this is an example. So it's not hard to see that when you arrive to this, to this moment, then actually you can just read off the maximum flow of the graph by just looking at the flipped, at the flipped arcs. Okay, and you know, this is, you know, this is like simple purely combinatorial and greedy, you just build the flow path by path, it's, it's really beautiful and elegant algorithm, an elegant fra framework, and that's all great. What is a bit less great about it is that this actually is very hard to analyze the performance of this kind of procedure. Okay, so there is a very easy analysis that, you know, just you can, if you uh, implement this thing naively, it's not hard to see that you are getting n squared algorithm, you essentially have, you know, you can argument the flow by at most n times, because this is the maximum value of the flow you can have, and then finding each uh, path takes you linear time, this is a sparse graph. So that gives you n squared. And then you know you have to already be a bit quite a bit more sophisticated and have to use a bit more clever arguments to improve it to the n to the three halves. So that's exactly what Karzanov and Ivan and Tarjan did. But you know, that happened quite a while ago. 
And since then, it's not clear you know, how to push this framework any further. So I definitely tried and failed. And I suspect that I was not on the only one who tried and failed. So, so definitely there is something, uh, something that doesn't work here, or at least we don't understand here. So yeah, what you do in such a situation, you can either try to push harder, or you can just try to develop a different approach, as Feder said. You know, that's, that's, what you, that's what you should do. So that's exactly where you know, this brings us to, you know, to this kind of a new approach to the maximum flow problem. And as you already know, you know, it is, okay, so first of all, I will just focus on the undirected uh, variant. I will address the directed variant only towards the end of these lectures. But, you know, again, the key ideas are already in this, in this, you know, in this context. And I think if you can understand even uh, like this variant, you will be already quite well off. So yeah, so we know that somehow the secret here is to approach max flow from the point of view of continuous optimization, okay? But what does it really mean? Okay, so, so how do you like take this maximum flow which talks about paths and capacities and stuff, and how do you view it as a continuous optimization progress? Well, you know, there is like the first step, you know, very simple mathematically but very important conceptually, is to stop thinking of a flow as a collection of paths, of ST paths, but think of it actually as just a linear algebraic object. So essentially the language of continuous optimization is linear algebra, not discrete mathematic. So of course you want to translate all the objects you talk about into the language of linear algebra. In particular, you want to view the flow as a vector in, uh, in the m-dimensional space. And you know, this is actually very easy to, to figure out some representation. So you view it as an m-dimensional vector. So you have a vector, like you have an entry per every edge of the graph. Okay, and now essentially if I have a flow f, what I put on the, e, on the coordinate corresponding to an edge e is just, you know, uh, well, okay, so what I think about it, there is some kind of orientation of the edges. So essentially there is just like a positive direction and negative direction. And then, you know, if there is a flow of uh, f e units of flow in the positive direction, then I just put f e on this coordinate. If there is a flow of, of you know, of f e units in the negative direction, I just, I just put minus f e on it. Okay, clearly this way I can encode any flow uh, in my graph as a, you know, as a vector, and you know, every vector corresponds to a flow. It might not be an ST flow, but it will be some kind of you know, encoding of flows over the arcs. Okay, so this is kind of you know, very simple uh, equivalence. And, you know, and from now on, we really want to think of flows as vectors, not as collections of paths. Okay, so now that actually was a very important step. Now, of course, the second step is, okay, now we know what the object is uh, in linear algebraic terms. Now we want to actually translate it into uh, also like what is the problem, the maximum flow problem in continuous optimization language. And what you will end up doing here is essentially what you will ask about is just, you want to find a vector f that is m-dimensional that, you know, essentially optimizes over all the encodings, all the vectors that encode an st flow of value one. Okay, and what you want to minimize is the maximum uh, value of flow on any of the edges. Okay, so let's just go slowly here. So essentially, first of all, this like maximum, like if I look at the maximum absolute value entry of a vector, it actually has a nice name. It's called L infinity norm of a vector. So you are trying to minimize the L infinity, f uh, L in L infinity f norm of a vector over the, you know, all the vectors that encode an ST flow of value one. Okay. Why this is max flow? Well, because you see here, I just fixed the value. Uh, so, you know, so that seems to be a bit different because in max flow, we want to maximize the value, but essentially we, I just essentially flipped things around. So, you know, I just fixed the value and now I want you to minimize, we, are, uh, we want to minimize the capacity you need to route this one unit of, uh, unit of flow. So essentially like the, uh, the f if I take the optimal, the maximum flow and just scale it down to be a value of one, then the maximum capacity I will need will be one over F star. So we're talking about unit capacity flow here. So essentially it will be one over F star. So, you know, so just, you know, if I want to get the actual max flow back, I just have to multiply back everything to just get, you know, the maximum capacity to, to be one again. So this is just like model the scaling, which might be a bit confusing. This is equivalent, completely equivalent to the maximum flow problem. Okay, and this is the problem that we want to solve. Okay, so far so good? Good. So now, you know, so now we phrase max flow as a continuous optimization question, and the beautiful thing is that now we are essentially done. Okay, because now we are in the world of continuous optimization, and you know, there are some standard continuous optimization tools to solve this kind of problems. Okay, and essentially, so just, you know, so just to recall, so this is the problem we are solving, and just to get some, some uh, geometric intuition is that 
No, so essentially, if I look at the space of all the vectors that corresponds to unit density flows, and as you will see, this actually is an affine subspace of the whole subspace of the whole space. What we do is essentially, well, we, what we want to find, we want to find the you know minimum radius box around the origin that intersects this space, like this this uh, subspace of unit capacity flow. So essentially, we want to find this like this uh, intersection of this like minimum minimum uh, minimum side box around origin and this affine subspace corresponding to the max flow. That's the problem we are trying to solve. And you know how do we solve it? Well, there's essentially in continuous optimization, as you will see, there's essentially only one algorithm. Yeah, this is a field of one algorithm, but you know used in very clever ways. So this algorithm is called well gradient descent, and for technical reasons that I will explain later, it's called subgradient descent because it's actually using subgradients and not gradients. But let's just not worry about that. And this is like the simplest algorithm you can imagine. It's essentially the you know a continuous version of a greedy strategy. Okay. So what do you do? Well, essentially, you start with some arbitrary unit flow, unit ST flow f, that might be very suboptimal. And now what you do? Well, you just like figure out how to locally improve it the most. Okay. So essentially, what you want to do? Well, in each step, what you do? You compute, you compute a new flow, which is just your old flow minus just you know a modification of this flow that uh, that reduces the objective value the most. Okay, so if you think about the question, okay, I fix a uh, flow and I fix objective. What is the direction that uh, reduces the, you know, re reduces the uh, well, the value of this function the most? Then you will come up with that essentially this direction is called a subgradient or just a gradient, depending if the function is differentiable or not. And essentially this is like the steepest increase direction, so we just go in the opposite side of the steepest increase direction. That's the way to like most efficiently locally reduce the value of the of the objective, and in this case, when you think of minimizing an infinity, essentially what you just have to do is just want to look at all the coordinates that achieve the maximum of this you know of this absolute value, and you just reduce like you just either push them down if they are positive or push them up if they are negative to reduce the absolute value. Again, nothing too crazy here, right? Nothing too surprising. But this is the algorithm. Essentially, like so, okay, so you modify this flow f to just improve the value of the objective. But now, of course, the problem is, and there is just some step size that just like, is a, it's a scale that just tells you how far you go in that direction. But, you know, of course, the problem is that once you, once you do that, once you actually apply this, you know, this, this update, there is no guarantee that what you get after this update is actually a valid ST flow anymore, right? Because you just like added or subtracted some flow from arbitrary, uh, arbitrary edges. So what you have to do, well, you have to fix it somehow. And the way you do it is essentially you, what you do, you just project back your new solution to the space of all the feasible ST flows, so all the unit ST flows. So essentially what you do, you just find you know, the closest in, you know, in Euclidean norm, like the closest flow in this affine subspace to the point that you just obtained. Okay? And, you know, and that's, that's it, so now you are back in the feasible, so you have a feasible solution that hopefully is, you know, should be an improvement over your previous solution. And what you do, just this is the whole algorithm, just like, you, know, you just do it for t, some, some t number of steps until you are happy with the result or you are bored. And, you know, and that's, that's the algorithm, okay? So, uh, here we use the gradient descent, so, but if the problem, say, if somehow our objective function is, say, convex or something, easier to get analytical conditions? Well, uh, yes, so, so very good question, actually. So yes, so first of all, like, so here, the, this is actually convex already. Like, the problem is convex, and we'll talk about the role of convexity, but the point is that we, this is an iterative method. It never tries to find analytic solutions to the problem. Like, somehow the whole point here is that actually, the, the usually, there does not exist an analytic solution to the problem. So the whole point is, uh, I actually don't know if, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Even for max flow, I don't know if there is an analytic solution. So we are, so exactly like we are try doing the opposite. Like we don't try to figure out what is an analytic solution. What we try instead is just like doing this local approximation that eventually will uh, get us closer to the solution. But in particular, we never get an optimal solution here. We always just approach it closer and closer and closer. So, but, uh, I may be wrong, but sometimes. There are analytical solutions, but we don't go for them. Yes, and, and, and we will talk about it. But these are very rare cases. But indeed, uh, when we talk on tomorrow, we will talk. There will be an example where we actually know what is the optimal solution. Uh, like we can write a formula, but everything's formula is actually too expensive. So we actually use this kind of iterative methods to get there. But this is like a very rare case. This is actually yeah. But but that's a very good question. Okay, so that's the algorithm. And yeah, the only non-trivial element that I really didn't tell you how to do is just the computing this, pro this projection. So could you please repeat how mu is, is, is determined? 
Sorry? Yeah, so how this oh, I didn't tell you at all uh, the eta, you mean? Like the, the step size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for now I, I just, you will see. For now it's it just, there is some setting that that works. That's a good question, but for now it's just, uh, it, it's under the carpet. Uh, you know, so the, the only non-trivial element is just like how to compute this projection. And this actually is a non-trivial element, but it turns out that, you know, we all have seen already what is the solution to it. And the solution to it is okay. So what I want to do is I, I'm given a flow that is just a flow, not necessarily an ST, ST, unit ST flow, and I want to find the closest in L2 norm, uh, uh, L2 norm uh, unit, unit ST flow to it. And again, this is a linear algebra question, right? Because I'm talking about 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 vectors, okay? And I find subspace, and you know, want to compute exactly you know the closest the closest thing. So this is an exercise. But if you think of, of about it for a moment, what you realize that the thing you are trying to compute is essentially you are trying to find an electrical flow in your graph. So essentially, so in general, the electrical flow corresponds to a situation when I have an undirected graph G. I have resistances on edges, and I have an S and T. And what I want to find, essentially, well, this is the closest formulation to what I need here. Essentially, I want to find you know, the way of sending some f, here f will be 1. So one unit of flow from S to T in a way that minimizes the energy. Okay, and the energy here just, sorry, the energy here is just the sum over, over, over edges, the resistance of the edge, which here will be 1, times the flow on this edge squared. Okay, so essentially we just try to minimize the dissipation, dissipation of energy, if you remember from physics. So this is like, so again, we went from linear algebraic object and ended up into thinking about like electrical flows, which actually is something that, you know, at least, you know, you would, in the retrospect, you should expect this to happen if you are talking about max flow. But you know, again, you don't have to know what flows are, you can just view it as a purely linear algebraic question. Okay, and now what is even fun, uh, more fun, is that actually, you know, this computing of electrical flow is, a very interesting question because uh, it came from linear algebra, so essentially it corresponds to projections and it co projections correspond to linear systems. So all you really need to do to compute electrical flow is to solve a linear system, and it's actually a special type of linear system called Laplacian system, where the constraint matrix is a graph Laplacian, and we'll talk about Laplacian uh, uh, in a moment. For now, I just just tell you that this is like an important matrix to have in a graph, and it turns out that for this kind of uh, uh, linear systems, we actually can solve them extremely e efficiently. So there was like a beautiful result of Spielman and Tank that then it was like beautifully simplified and you know extended in the follow-up work that essentially tells you that this kind of systems we can solve extremely efficiently. And I will talk a little bit about you know what are the ideas that go into that. Okay, I will not talk, be able to talk about everything, but I will give you at least a flavor of how does it come into play. But yeah, this is the only non-trivial, algorithmically non-trivial part, how to solve the system, how to compute these projections uh, quickly. But once you have it as a black box, you know, this is your algorithm. And now you, know, you don't even have to think too much because you know, this is a standard algorithm, so you can, there's also a standard analysis of how fast uh, does it work. And what it gives you is gives you that after roughly n squared over epsilon squared, uh, iterations of this loop, you will get a one, one plus epsilon approximation solution to max flow. That's uh, resu so resulting time since you know you, you need to spin, uh, spend nonlinear time to compute each of these projections. So this gives you n cube over epsilon squared algorithm. That's not impressive. Uh, we can definitely do better than that. I hope we all want to know how to do it better. So in particular, we know that we can do n to the three halves and get exact uh, answer. But somehow what I want you to do is just to look beyond that. Because first of all, what is really important here is that our approach was completely principled and robust. Like it was completely automatic. We didn't have to think at almost any point of what we were doing. And that's actually there's a great value in that. Second of all, this was just really like the most generic and off-the-shelf attempt. So what happens is that once you know, okay, this is the problem I want to solve, you know, continuous optimization has a lot of techniques to speed up this convergence. And as we will see, once you use these te techniques, which are again quite, quite general, they just say, okay, once this is the problem you want to solve, you can just see which one of them applies, you will get a significant speed up uh, than, uh, to what is happening. So which step not exact? Where are you getting this approximation type? Well, the, ex uh, well, the thing is that this never converges. So essentially you compute all, everything exactly, but the point is that you are just like getting closer and closer and closer. As you will be getting closer to the optimal solution, your steps will be shorter and shorter. So essentially there's just convergence. Like, the, like every, all the steps we, uh, we compute exactly, mm -hmm. but in the end, you know, we are only approaching the, the optimum because we are always using sort of an approximate way of getting in that direction. Okay, but that's a great question. And that's inherently approximate. But again, we will talk about that as well, because at first there is, you know, it, it looks all 
different and that's what it's supposed to do, but again, it all makes sense. Okay? So this is, this is for now, all I wanted to say how to, how to use max, how to use continuous optimization to solve max flow problem. We will revisit this question. Now I just want to spend some time, and how I'm doing on time, actually. Oh, I'm good, okay. So it means I speak too fast, and then you should stop me. Um, so essentially, so let me just like talk a little bit more about electrical flows. Again, we will e e revisit this even more, but like somehow it's a very important, it's a, a very important object uh, by itself, electrical flow. So let's just me spend some time about like talking about that. So essentially, so what are electrical flows? So I already told you that essentially when you talk about electrical flows, we think of an underrated graph G, some resistances, some source S and some sink T, and then what we essentially, this is, you know, like there is one physics 101 definition in which, you know, what I do is that I just think of edges of the graph as, uh, as resist resistors, okay, of the corresponding resistance, and then what I do is I just connect a battery to S and T, and I look at the current that settles in this in the system. Okay, that's, that's essentially one way that's essentially one way to, uh, well, to define electrical flows. These are really the things that we know from physics. But of course, it's not the best thing to work with when you want to do some math. So the other equivalent definition it goes through, you know, through sort of Ohm's law and sort of gives us a mathematical uh, characterization of uh, electrical flows. So what it says is that essentially, you know, all that I need to do to find the electrical flow, and that's essentially the only way to get the electrical flow, is just to find vertex potential, so essentially numbers assigned to every uh, vertex, such that if I look at, you know, at what Ohm's law tells me, what is the flow induced in the graph by this potential, so I just look for every edge at the difference of the potentials over this edge and divide by the resistance, I will get a flow. So essentially, electrical flow is the unique, uh, uh, unique ST flow of value f that you can get in, uh, via, via, the, via, via this way. Okay, so essentially there is only one, f uh, one uh, ST flow of value f that you can get via this recipe, and this is exactly the electrical flow. Okay, so you can get many different flows by just uh, choosing, uh, choosing different potentials, but there is only one, well, there is only one valid ST flow that you can ever get uh, via, via this recipe, and that's exactly electrical flow. Okay, so this is so kind of the dual, dual formulation of the, of the problem. So, so, so once again, if we fix the value of the flaw, then there is a unique way of assigning this potential. It, it's a little bit more relaxed. So essentially, like, okay, so. Well, for every setting of for every setting of of this potential phi, so essentially we have like n degrees of freedom, okay? There is a flow that it induces, okay? But not all the flows can be induced by vertex potentials. In particular, there is only as a, a unique uh, ST flow value f that can be uh, that can be obtained by this way, and that's exactly electrical flow. Okay, so essentially, you know, uh, like the flows have an m degrees of freedom, uh, 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 potentials have n degrees of freedom, so this is smaller. So you are not able to get all the flows, and exactly like the one, S, the one unique ST flow, uh, uh, valid ST flow that you get by this recipe is exactly a electrical flow. Okay? Good. So, yeah, so in particular, valid ST flow just means that we have no leaks at, at, at other vertices than S and T, and you have a deficit of F and excess of F at S and T uh, correspondingly. So that means that, you know, essentially there's only one flow that you can get, this would be electrical flow. Okay, and there is actually like third definition that I already showed you, which is again also equivalent. It's exactly this like principle, this kind of continuous optimization point of view on what electrical flows are, is that exactly this is the, you know, this corresponds to L2 minimization over the space of, you know, of valid ST flows that essentially you just find the way that is most efficient, like you don't care about, like you just find the way that is most efficient from the point of view of energy. And that will be again, electrical flow, okay? And I don't know, we probably don't have exercises here, but if there was exercises, I would uh, recommend you to go through this, to see this equivalence of these two definitions, because it's very uh, much revealing about what's going on over there, okay? So yeah, so this is exactly what electrical flows are, and then uh, how to compute them. I already told you, just you have to solve a linear system, and somehow, yeah, so, but let's try to, like, uh, well, dig a bit deeper there. So first of all, we can uh, set up the value of our electrical flow to be always one, because electrical flows are completely scale invariant. So if I have electrical flow, ST flow of value one, then just I can get electrical ST flow of value F by just multiplying everything by F. So essentially just fi fixing F to be one is completely without lots of generality. And now, you know, as you already know from one definition, all that we really need to know is just to compute a vertex potentials that induce a unit ST flow hour graph. 
Okay? So yeah, Ohm's law, so first of all, let's translate everything into the language of linear algebra, because that's, you know, what the, that's, the, that's the language we work with him. So I just claim that the Ohm's law can be, you know, once I think of, of potentials as also a vector, uh, in n-dimensional space with each coordinate corresponding to a, uh, to a vertex, then I claim that you know, this equation gives me exactly the Ohm's law. Okay, so essentially like this is how I relate the induced flow and the potentials to each other. So what are these matrices? So you know, we know what F is, it's again you know, the, well, uh, the, usual, the usual encoding. And now R is just a diagonal matrix that you know has uh, you know, it has uh, well entry per every edge and just the entry is you know, the resistance of the edge. And then finally, the most interesting matrix is B, which is just a matrix that essentially is, you know, V by, uh, well, the N by N by M, and essentially the, each column uh, just has one plus one and one minus one that corresponds to the head and tail of the, each of the edges. Okay, and I will show you an example in a second because no one can really pass these things in the, in the real time. So imagine this is my graph. And essentially, uh, like imagine that I always orient edges from like smaller index vertex to the higher index vertex. So just, this just indicates the positive direction of the flow. Then you know this is the matrix B. So you see for every edge, okay. So this is matrix B. This is matrix R. So you see for every edge, I have one column, and it has like minus one at the vertex, which is the, the which is the tail of the edge uh, in the orientation, and one at the at the head of this edge in the orientation, and there are zeros everywhere else. And then, of course, the corresponding entry in the in the resistance matrix is just like the resistance of this edge. So I just do it for every edge. So it's a very simple recipe to get these matrices. And now what you can see is that if this is my example vector of potentials, then if I apply uh, these two things to each other, then essentially I will get I will get exactly the flow induced by Ohm, uh, via Ohm's law uh, in this in this graph. Yeah. You started from undirected graph. Right? Yes. Yes, yes. So when I say about tails and heads, it's just orientation. It's just like the way to encode for me, you know, what is the positive direction and what is the negative direction. But some of the flows here, okay, I didn't do it here, but some, oh no, here, you see? Uh, why, why there is not on the picture? So here, yeah, you see there is minus here, which means I'm flowing one in the opposite direction. So, so it's still undirected. It just, the way I just need to, you know, uh, differentiate between different directions of the flow, but I allow it to flow in both directions, okay? So the orientation is part of your input? Your well, you can set it up, yes. Well, you just have to fix it. Like, as long as you fix it, it's fine. And you have to be, like, everything has to be consistent with respect to the orientation, just so you don't confuse uh, things. But it's completely arbitrary how you do it. Okay? Good. So this is just, you know, how the Ohm's law works, but now we know what is the definition of electrical flow. Well, we actually want this uh, this flow, uh, uh, this flow, uh, the no, like induced by the flexible potentials, to actually be an unit ST flow. So what does it mean? Well, so if I now have a, you know, we we'll now have a flow F, which I think of as a vector as well. How would I check the condition that actually this is a unit ST flow? Well, essentially, it turns out that I just use the same matrix B again, but just it's not transpose is actually uh, without the transpose. So it goes from the space of flows into the space of vertices. And essentially what happens is that if you multiply B times F and you just check what you are getting, then essentially the, there will be entry, there will, you get a vector that has an entry for every vertex. And this entry of this vertex will be exactly the, the, you know, the net inflow or outflow of a given vertex. So this will give just the flow balance at the given vertex. And now all you really want to check is that in the end this balance should be zero for every vertex and then S and T should be minus one at S and plus one at T. Okay, and that's the condition you want to check. Okay, so if you put all of these things together, then the condition that you want to check is that you would like to find a vertex of potentials that after you apply, well, first the Ohm's law and then this like uh, uh, balance check uh, matrix B, here again, you will get a vector that has like prescribed pattern of deficits and surpluses of flow. Okay, so indeed, you know, but this is exactly, you know, uh, okay, so let's just see it on an example. So here, you know, we have again potentials, here we have flow, and now let's check what are its, what, what are its uh, deficits. So this is like the flows and inflows that you get for every vertex after applying the matrix B. Clearly, this is not what you would like because you would like to have zero minus one, zero minus uh, one, zero. So that's not, so this means that these are not vertex potentials that induce an um, uh, electrical flow, and this is not an electrical flow. So, but yeah, if you magically come up with the right numbers, you will realize that this is the flow that you get. And when you check the, you know, the, the check and balances, you will get exactly the pattern that you need, which is, shows that this indeed is an electrical flow, ST flow in our graph. Okay? So all that you have to do is just have to 
come up with this magic phi's, but this is exactly, you know, this is exactly a linear system. This is just a matrix. This is uh, your unknowns, and this is the vector b that you would like to match. So you know, so it, so it's exactly solving linear system with this matrix, and you know, in general this is bad because just solving linear systems actually takes you know n to the omega time if you just have an arbitrary linear system. But you know, the, the beautiful thing is that actually if you multiply out what you get here, this will be exactly the Laplacian uh, matrix of a, of a graph, which I will talk about in a second, in a moment, which is this key object of a field called spectral graph theory, which again, I will also talk about uh, in a moment, so I will not talk about it now. And essentially you can solve this kind of problems in nearly linear time, as I already said, and we'll talk about this as well. Okay, so I will not hiding from you too many details, I'm just deferring some. Okay, and this is really, this is really important, and, and also we see how this little algebraic language is playing, playing out here. Okay, and yeah, we will get back to this. Okay, so yeah, as a result, you can compute in linear time, and you know, the question is, you know, how to utilize it. So, you know, already we know that for max flow you can use it. There are actually many other applications of vertical flows uh, for like sampling random spanning trees and for partitioning graphs and so on and so on. So, you know, so this is just something for you to think about. It. There is this kind of very non-trivial primitive that you get in nonlinear time, so at the test, at the time that just to compute a DFS or BFS, you actually can compute elliptical flows. The question is no. Whenever you have such a hammer, you should try to, you know, to 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 whack, you know, whatever is the problem you care about with it, because maybe it gives you some new power that you didn't realize uh, you had before. Okay, so this definitely happened already in a couple of areas. So that's a uh, that's a one primitive to keep in mind when you think about uh, graphs. Okay, and yes, and the last thing I want to do in this spare time is exactly, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, spectral graph theory, which is essentially the field that the whole purpose of spectral graph theory is just try to understand the combinatorial structure of the graph by looking at linear algebraic properties of the associated matrix, <coughs> namely the Laplace matrix. Okay, so you look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the, of the matrix, and you would like to infer some information about how does the, groove, uh, the, the, the graph, the graph uh, look like from the <coughs> point of view of combinatorial notions. So in particular, yes, the central object is the Laplace matrix, which, you know, uh, well, I already told you one way of getting it is just getting this matrix B, uh, R minus one, and B transpose, but actually the equivalent definition is just, I, I just take a diagonal matrix that corresponds to the degrees, Okay, so essentially this is the diagonal matrix with each vertex just is total degree, and this is the adjacency matrix that we all know from uh, from other uh, from other contexts that essentially encodes the, the the connectivity structure, and essentially yeah, when you multiply out it out, then this is what you will get uh, entry wise. It's not that important what you get here, but you know, uh, yeah. So just just a quick example. So we have a graph, and the Laplace here is over uh, is, is something like that, and the way to understand it is just essentially like each edge. Here is an edge of weight three. It contributes essentially to, to the degrees, so the diagonal elements. These are the degrees, and then also it's just this minus three and minus three that corresponds to the just connectivity of the corresponding vertices. And essentially, the whole Laplacian is just some of these elementary Laplacians, uh, well, of all the you know of all the edges of the graph. Okay, this is a very nice additive structure, and yeah, and yeah, it's also. Uh, somehow, this is a, like it also gives a very nice quadratic uh, quadratic form that has some very very nice properties that you can analyze. Okay, this is just to to, to show you that, and somehow, yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, well, LE is just a, essentially this is a this is a Laplacian of a, imagine that you have a graph on V vertices that has only one edge E. Okay. So that's the Laplace. And essentially something that has just like one on this diagonal, one on this diagonal, and minus one, minus one here. So that's a very, this elementary matrix. And actually, you just, just multiply times weight and then just take some of the edges and you will get the big Laplace. That's something very, very nice. Okay, and now you know the key thing we care about is the the spectrum of the Laplacian. So Laplacian is an n by n symmetric matrix. So now we just apply the linear algebraic view on stuff. So we know that it has to have n real eigenvalues. Okay, not all the matrices have real eigenvalues, but every symmetric uh, uh, symmetric uh, <coughs> matrix has n real eigenvalues. And in particular, you, it means that you can uh, actually you can actually order them. Okay, and somehow what you can show is that actually the first the smallest eigenvalue is not interesting. It's always zero, and its corresponding eigenvector is just all ones vector. But the uh, but it turns out that you know first of all you can compute them actually quite fast, like at least the first couple of them, and somehow the most important eigenvalue, like so the first eigenvalue is very in uninformative, 
But the second eigenvalue is actually extremely, has like some very, very interesting meaning and very interesting connections to the structure of the graph. So, so like the, the second eigenvalue is the really interesting one. So in particular, you know, one, uh, one, the, only con the only connection I will really, really mention here is that essentially the second eigenvalue is zero if and only if the graph G is disconnected. Okay, and in particular, you can even generalize it just saying that the k smallest eigenvalue is zero, if and only if G has at least k connected components. So, so already this number, you know, uh, whether it's zero or no, tells you whether the graph is connected or not. But actually, you can even make it quantitative, and essentially, it, you can use it to measure how well connected your graph is. Okay, so it's not only about being zero and non-zero, it's actually how large it is, it tells you how connected the graph is. So the right notion of connectivity here is the so-called sparsity. So essentially, you just look at the ratio of the edges cut so for a given cut, you just look at the sparsity, which is as the number of edges cut, divided by the sum of the degrees in the smaller part of the graph. So essentially, you just want these things to be, like you want to favor the things that are balanced, that essentially like, uh, cut things into roughly a half. Okay? Yes, well, it is the feature of expansion as well. Like, well, it, it depends how you normalize these things, but within constant factor, yes, it's also called expansion. Essentially, it just says it's not only about minimizing the cuts, but also you would like to sort of uh, like find a big bottleneck to separate two big parts of the cuts. And essentially, when there's no good bottlenecks, bottlenecks, you mean that you have good expansion. And expanders, in particular, are graphs for which this is quite high. Okay, so this is just for a, for a particular cut, but then you would like to then what you would like to do is just we would like to think at the you know the most bottlenecking cut in the graph, and that gives you exactly the well this the sparsity of the like, graph conductance, graph sparsity or expansion. They all differ in some like technical details, uh, but yeah, this is notion of like how well connected your graph is, and it turns out that essentially okay so yeah so if this is large the graph is well connected it's practically an expander. If it's small the graph has some bottlenecking cut that essentially is able to split the graph into two big parts while cutting only a, f a small number of edges, and somehow the connection is this is like the one of the key key developments in specular theory because Chigurh's inequality actually was developed first in the context of of manifolds in continuous mathematics, no surprisingly, and then it was sort of transferred over to discrete setting by Aron and Milman. And what it roughly says is that, you know, that essentially what it tells you is just, just two things. That essentially, well, it says that up, uh, well, up to this kind of, uh, you know, linear versus square root of factor, uh, you know, the value of second, or, uh, of second smallest eigenvalue tells you how, you know, how, how expanding your graph is. Okay, so there is this, there is, it's not only like zero or one, uh, kind of zero or non-zero kind of phenomena, it's really like quite smooth. Saying, so, you know, the larger the second smallest eigenvalue is, the, the better connected your graph is. Okay, and of course, uh, in particular, uh, one side of this thing is, is, is constructive. So essentially, if I have a graph in which the value, if, well, if in which, you know, the value of lambda two is something, I can actually very, in linear time, I can find a cut that essentially meets this upper bound here. So essentially, I will find a cut of sparsity that is at most two times square root of lambda two in linear time. And so in particular, so one thing to note is that actually computing the expansion of the graph is NP hard. So this gives you an approximation. So it gives you like a strange approximation. It gives you like one over square root of uh, lambda two approximation. And by the way, this is a normalized uh, Laplace. So these things are always smaller than one. So it all makes sense. And you no, know, when lambda two is large, so when you have an expander, this is actually a very good constant approximation. And this is actually something the best way. Like constant is something that we cannot get in general for this problem. So this is well, this is this is one thing, but you know when lambda two is small, it's actually a very poor approximation, and somehow it doesn't work very well. And unfortunately, you could wonder if you can somehow do something about this like square root versus lambda thing. But it turns out that this gap is actually uh, no. Like if you w want to have a theorem like that, this is the best you can do because you can have an example for graphs that meet either this part or this part here. Okay, but still, it's actually extremely useful connection. So there is like the best known sparse cut algorithm. They actually use this connection by embedding expander into your graph and then using this kind of fact that in the expanders, you can uh, well, approximate uh, phi within a constant factor in linear time to actually get like square root of log n approximation in the end. Okay, but yeah. But this is a gap combinatorial, right? So or there's also an algorithmic <coughs> gap also saying that you cannot do anything. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so the, the, like the, the logarithmic gap is combinatorial. This is, this is not combinatorial gap. This is something, this is, actu this is exactly, actually the reason why you get fooled into square root and to, uh, versus linear is exactly because things might be fractional. And that's like the, the bad solutions are the fractional solutions actually. So this is actually very anti-combinatorial uh, thing. Okay? 
And as the last thing I want to very quickly mention, so the other very important process in the graph is the random walk process, in which you think of this as a, like paint, sp a paint, sp a paint spinning in the graph, in, in your graph, when you put all the like total mass of one of paint on one vertex, and then in each run, what you do, you just split the paint on the vertex uh, into halves, and then you like just keep one of this uh, half put at the vertex, and then you distribute the other uniformly among the neighbors, and you do it for all the vertices in simultaneously. So you will get this kind of, you know. Uh, kind of diffusion process in your graph, which corresponds exactly to the probability distribution of a lazy random walk. And you know, what we know is that you know, in the limit of, you know, of, of, of uh, uh, iterating this process to infinity, essentially we will converge, uh, modulo some mild condition, will converge to a stationary distribution. That is essentially uh, the amount of, pound, uh, pint at every, uh, of paint at every uh, vertex will be proportional to its degree. And it turns out now, but how fast is this convergence? So like, we know, I know in the limit, that's what I will get, but like, how fast will I get there? Like, what's the rate of convergence? It turns out that the convergence is exactly given by the, like, the inverse of lambda 2. So essentially, for graphs that are well connected, where lambda 2 is large, this will be very quick convergence to the stationary distribution. For graphs where this is small, when I are poorly connected, actually, you might, in the worst case, have to wait a long, a, a long time. Yes, but the funny thing is that this is not in terms of the conductance, it's actually in the terms of lambda 2 exactly. Like, lambda 2 is exactly the right quantity that governs the, like, the convergence of this process. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is like used in numerous places, that this kind of connection. Okay, all I just want to say for the moment is that this is all about lambda 2, but actually it turns out that you can get some stronger estimates of the conductance when you can also use some uh, like higher order eigenvalues, particularly when the higher order eigenvalues are large. But yeah, I will not talk about it. And, and then, of course, also, you know, uh, electrical flows, you can view it as a, as a generalization of looking at the eigenvalues. Somehow the electrical flow, when you look at something called effective resistance, which is exactly what you, want, what you know from physics as effective resistance, uh, here it, you can just express it as a linear algebraic object, when this is like essentially an inverse of the Laplacian, except the Laplacian is not invertible because it has one subspace of, uh, well, it has one eigenvalue zero, right? So it cannot be. Uh, like it's not invertible everywhere, but you know you just look at the at, at the parts that are invertible, and uh, well, then essentially this is a linear algebraic formula for effective resistance, and you know it it turns out that you can use it in some very interesting ways. In particular, you can understand you know the commute time uh, of the random walk using this quantity. You can do graph sparsification using it. Essentially, like if you want to sparsify your, uh, your vector, so essentially if you want to get an equivalent, computerally equivalent uh, a graph that is has many like it's, it's essentially sparse. Then the way to do it, you just take your original graph and you just sample sample edges, like you sample roughly n, o, n log n over epsilon squared edges, proportional to the effective resistance of, of the edges, and you will get a, with high probability you will get a graph that is sparser, has the same properties, and you know, and, and it is nice. Yes. Sorry, lambda two is second smallest or largest? Right? Smallest. smallest, second smallest. And it converges for alpha two for one divided lambda two. Yes. So, yes. So essentially, so it's exactly like so. Essentially, uh, like the the better connected the graph is, the larger is lambda two. So this so this rate of convergence. <laughs> yeah. No. So the quantity is the second smallest eigenvalue. Okay. But then the, the question is, how large is the second smallest eigenvalue? It tells you what is the connectivity. So the larger it is, the more connected the graph it is. Okay, and the smaller it is, the less connected the graph it is. Because in particular, we know that at the limit, like if lambda two is zero, the graph is disconnected. disconnected. <coughs> so essentially, this, this gives you the whole, the whole spectrum. And then the convergence is exactly inversely proportional. So essentially, when this is small, the con uh, oh, I see. Okay, so what I mean, I, I think, depending how you de define convergence rate. So yeah, essentially, uh, it takes longer when lambda two is smaller, and it takes less time if, if lambda two is larger. So that's what I meant. I, I think people might view convergence rate as also, yeah, uh, differently. But yeah, this is the intuition. Okay. Okay, and I guess that's yeah, that's I think all I wanted to say. And yeah, in the next lecture, we'll actually dive in into talking about the gradient descent and subgradient descent and understand you know where all these things are coming from. Okay, any questions? Just by looking at that, and I mean, but somehow it's 
see the connection? How does it help you design and? Yes. So, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, the, like I will not really have time to talk about too much about this. But yeah, you, you have to first know this connection and then you, you view it. So, uh, yeah, I will not have time. Uh, you know, like yeah. So, so there are some examples when this helps, in particular for approximating uh, sparse, uh, uh, like uh, uh, sparse scat. This was used in a powerful way. But yeah, indeed, you have to know this connection and then know how to apply them. In particular, you know, sparsification is very powerful. Uh, primitive, like essentially know what you can do with it, and then it, it's a new thing in your toolbox. And essentially, like a lot of like over the last eight years, like a lot of new developments in, in, in algorithms are exactly using one of these ideas. In particular, sparsification was a very powerful idea. But yeah, you have to first. I will not talk about it anymore, and yeah, you need to know a bit more to start seeing the connection. So. So because if you want to distribute the data algorithm. Yes. And if you want to use the fact that like, you know the second one is like in So you have to first process the graph. Yes. <laughs> like which can, be, which can be costly for a very large yeah. it, it can be costly, except like actually this thing, so like in distributed computing it might be costly still, but like for parallel computing it actually, you can compute it very fast, like in logarithmic number of rounds, you can compute this thing. So I don't know how it exactly translates to distributed. I think I was about to think about it one time, but I never did. But yeah, there is a price to pay, but you know, it's not too bad so far. Like essentially for parallel computing, it actually you can afford still doing this. So one can do a parallel uh, computation and Yes. Sorry. So if you design a distributed algorithm based on that, so you have to first compute lambda, which you said takes yes. log n. Yes. No, no, but like it's n log n uh, in uh, in the sequential time. So actually, like in parallel time, for instance, it takes you log n time, log n rounds. So you add log n rounds to your. Yes. Yes. Which, depending on the application, might be something you can you can afford. Okay. Any other questions? I got it right. The electrical flow part is important in the projecting step. Yes. Program, right. So, but what I got from the electrical flow part is that this is actually a feasibility problem. Or no, no, it's not. Uh, like so, it's exactly. There's nothing about feasibility. Like essentially, okay, the projection is a feasibility question, right? right. But uh, what it ends up being, because it's linear algebra, uh, essentially, it, like the projections correspond to just like solving a linear system. And then this is a question of like of okay. So the way I view it is a question of optimization. Essentially, like all you have to do is just essentially drive the energy to like to be like minimal, and that's all of it. But like yeah, it's it's not a really feasibility question because. The fact that you have. Uh, only a single possible value for the potentials. Yes, yeah, you are right. In the end, there is like a unique answer, so you think it's a feasibility question. Except, uh, yes, you can get to this answer by uh, like just by improvements. Essentially, you can view it as like you, you minimize something iteratively until you you get there. So. Okay, so like, if that's the definition of a feasibility problem, then this is a feasibility problem. But the way you think, the way you approach it, is actually by thinking of minimizing the energy. So, so that's how you uh, how you essentially get there. Okay, so it's a pro it's an optimization problem that has just one solution. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, but the way you get to solutions by introducing subjective of energy and improving it until you get, you you get to the minimizer. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks.